Bless the Lord, O my soul, O my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. I'll worship Your holy name. I'll worship Your holy name. Well, this is the Lord's day. Have you been worshiping Him and giving Him honor this whole day? I trust that you have. And we are here once again, and we're so glad to have you here. Uh, we'd like to also congratulate Pastor Rob for bringing his team on Friday night. We won't tell him what we announced this morning as who was the winner, but tonight we will say that Grace Church was the winner on Friday night. We had a lot of good fellowship, and it was just wonderful for the children. So we want to continue this, and God will help us reach out to the youth. And right now we just had an emergency um, prayer request for Ethan, that Curry's grandson. He was, um, he's at home, I guess, and... He's at emergency. Okay, so let's pray. He was having some stomach problems, I think. So wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I pray that you will make your place a holy place. We invite the Holy Spirit here in our sanctuary so that the Holy Spirit can really work in us and we will be blessed by the words that will be spoken tonight. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this, your day that you called for us to sit aside to honor you. And because we love you, Lord, we love to honor you and we bless your name. We thank you for all that you've done this week and we look forward to being a blessing to people that you love and to whom you will send us. Tonight we pray especially for Ethan who's in ER right now. In the name of Jesus, we pray peace in his body and healing I pray that you will do an eternal work in his heart, mind, and spirit, and touch his body, we pray. And others there in need, in pain, in grief, or whatever they're going through, you're a God who said you will supply all our need according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So we will lift up your name and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together. With the voice of triumph, shout with the voice of praise, shout with the voice of triumph, shout with the voice of praise, shout unto God for the victory. Hey, give the Lord a shout of praise. Triumphant in battle, we are victorious. God is most high over all the earth. Jesus has conquered, Satan defeated. The enemy is under our feet. Shout with the voice of triumph. Shout with the voice of praise. Shout with the voice of triumph, shout with the voice of praise, shout unto God for the victory, hey, give the Lord a shout of praise, triumphant in battle, we are victorious, God is most high over all the earth. Jesus is conquered, Satan defeated, the enemy is under our feet. Shout for victory, shout to be set free, shout! Shout for the victory, shout to be set free, shout! Shout for the victory, shout to be set free, shout! 
You are God who shall be down to be It is He who shall break down our enemies will sing and shout the victory Christ is King For God has won the victory And set His people free His word is the enemy The earth shall stand and see that through our God we shall do validly. It is He who shall put down our enemies. We'll see and shout the victory. Christ is King. For God. For God has won the victory and set His people free. His word has slain the enemy. The earth shall stand and see that who our God. Who shall do valiantly? It is He who shut it down. Our enemies will sing and shout the victory. Christ is King. For God, for God. God has won the victory and set His people free. His word has slain the enemy. The earth shall stand and see that through our God. We shall do valiantly. It is He who shall put down our enemies. We'll sing and shout the victory. Christ is King. Christ is King. Christ is King. Hey, as David did in Jehovah's sight, I will dance with all my might. With the tambourine, I will clap my hands and sing before the King of Kings. We can come before Him and worship Him today. We joyful sound before the King of Kings. As Joshua did at Jericho, we will shout to defeat the foe before the King of Kings. We can come before you and worship Worship Him today. We will now adore Him. Jesus made a way. Shout with the voice of triumph. Shout with the voice of praise. Shout with the voice of triumph. Shout with the voice of praise. Shout out to God for the victory. Hey, 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 give the Lord a shout of praise. Triumphant in battle, we are victorious. God is most high over all the earth. Jesus has conquered, Satan defeated. The enemy is under our feet. Shout the victory. Shout the victory. Shout to be the free shout. Shout the victory. Shout to be the free shout. Shout the victory. Shout to be the free shout. Hallelujah. We've got the victory. Praise God. Just like on the basketball court. Praise God. We've got the victory. But we give God all the glory and all the praise. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and if you like to have fun, and if you think that Christians don't have fun, you should hang around as pastors. Don't we have fun, Pastor Rob? You are so much fun. 
And I'm tempted to announce who you're related to, but I will not because I promise. Can I? I count it a privilege to have this honor to introduce to you one of the relatives of the Three Stooges. His grandmother is sister to their mother. So if you see a close family resemblance, not in looks, because I think that Rob took it from the other side of the family. But his humor is like them. That's why we have a lot of fun. Come on, brother, you know that you're one of our favorite, and you're certainly a man of God, anointed, so God bless you. Thank you, Sister Barbara. I have been living with that secret for years, so I'm glad it's out. It's true. Our, my grandfather and grandmother both came from a small town in Lithuania, and we were aware of it all our lives that not all three of the Three Stooges appeared together in the same movie. You know, everybody knows Larry Fine, the guy with the hair out on the side. He's not a relative. But Curly, the guy who had no hair, they called him Curly, and Moe and Shemp were three brothers. And I don't think that there was any movie made where those three all appeared at the same time, but that was in show business. But it gets more shocking than that. That's on my father's side. Also on my father's side, my aunt was, uh, was related. In other words, my father's brother married a woman who was related to a playwright by the name of Arthur Miller. Arthur Miller wrote Death of a Salesman, The Crucible, and some well-known works. Nothing I ever enjoyed reading, but they were well known. And he married a very famous Hollywood star. Does anybody know who that was? Marilyn Monroe is right. So I am the missing link between Marilyn Monroe and the Three Stooges. <laughs> my grandmother was in show business, my mother was in show business, and some people who don't like my preaching think I'm in show business. Uh, but speaking of that, I will share one story that I really enjoy. I've been married, uh, happily married, to a wonderful woman for a number of years. And, of course, we all know where marriage came from. It was an invention of God in the Garden of Eden. And the story goes like this. Adam was feeling very lonely one day, and God came to him and said, Adam, I'll tell you what, I'm going to make a companion for you. She's going to be called woman. She's going to cook for you. She's going to clean. She's going to wash your clothes. She's going to bear your children. She's never going to ask you to get up in the middle of the night. She's never going to nag you. She will always agree with you. And if you have a disagreement, she will be the first one to admit that she's wrong. Adam said, God, wow, that sounds exciting. What will it cost me? And God said, it'll cost an arm and a leg. He said, what can I get for a rib? And the rest, as they say, is history. I've been talking about the names of God, and I know that we're prepping a video that I want to share with you. It's three minutes long. It has been a great blessing to me and an inspiration every time I see it. But since we're talking about the names of God, a pastor by the name of S.M. Lockridge gave a sermon, He's My King. And I would like you very much to watch this with me, if you would. Is this the right? This doesn't look like the same one that I had set up. Yeah, that's the one.
live across the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is lighter. hear a man like that, I wonder if I've ever preached a sermon in my life with that much inspiration and that much truth. I regard this three-minute video very highly because it covers so much about who the Lord is and what he's able to do. He's there for the weak. He's there for the strong. He's there for those that don't know what to do. He's provided wisdom. He's protection. Provides cleansing, healing. He could go on and on. I think the only word that he says there that says it all is he's indescribable. In the Thompson Chain Bible, there are 94 different names for God. 94. We consider that are students of the Scripture that Jesus Christ is none other than God the Son. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There's no difference. They are distinct in that the Father has a relationship with the Son, and the Son with the Father, and the Holy Spirit with the Son and with the Father. And that makes sense out of the times when Jesus prayed to the Father, and when the Father directed the Son. In that sense, they're separate, but they have a single mind They are perfectly unified. Someone asked a question of a theologian. He said, well, isn't the Trinity like the polytheistic religions? The answer, of course, that the theologian gave was correct. It's not like polytheistic because if you know anything about the ancient religions, such as the Greeks and the Romans had with many gods, the gods were always in contest with one another. But if you can imagine a being that's made up of three personalities who were in perfect coordination, their goals, their objectives, everything about them were united. You could not see a difference, nor would there ever be a difference in what they wanted to do. That unity is perfectly preserved within what we call the Trinity. 
Now, there are numerous scriptures in the Bible, and I've touched on them in messages past, that indicate that God sometimes speaks as a singular person, and he sometimes speaks as a plural being. Let us make man in our image. It's God speaking. So it was between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit that they created God. Uh, they created Adam in the image of God. This is an essential part of understanding all that God is. Now, beyond that, God has attributes. And these attributes of God are revealed to mankind who cannot contain all that God is and all that we understand about God in a single word or a single event. As Pastor Lockridge said, he's a king, he's a sovereign, he's a healer, he's a savior, he's all these things. Well, the 94 names, let me go through them just in a list form, if I could just touch on them and see if you recognize them. I have scripture references, but I'll skip over those. This is Christ. He's called in the scripture, starting in alphabetical order, he's called Adam, the, the second Adam. God made a race of mankind in the image of God with the first Adam. And now through Jesus Christ, he becomes the second Adam of a new race, new creations, you and me, who are born again. We belong to him. So he calls him Adam, advocate, almighty, alpha and omega, the amen, the apostle of our profession, the arm of the Lord, the author and the finisher of our faith, the author of eternal salvation, the beginning of the creation of God, the beloved Son, the blessed and only potentate, the branch, the bread of life, the captain of salvation, the chief shepherd, the Christ of God, the consolation of Israel, the cornerstone, the counselor, the creator, the day spring, deliverer, desire of all nations. He's the door, the elect of God, everlasting father, faithful witness, first and last, first begotten, the forerunner, the glory of the Lord, God he is called, God blessed, good savior, governor, great high priest, head of the church, heir of all things, the holy child, the holy one of Israel, the holy one of God, the horn of salvation, the great I am, the image of God, Emmanuel, Jehovah, Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, Judge of Israel, Just One, King, King of the Ages, King of the Jews, King of Kings. King of Saints, Lawgiver, Lamb, Lamb of God, Leader, Life, Light of the World, Lion of the Tribe of Judah. Lord of all, Lord of glory, Lord of lords, Lord of righteousness, and also Man of Sorrows, Mediator, Messenger of the Covenant, Messiah, Mighty God, Mighty One, Morning Star, Nazarene, Only Begotten Son, Our Passover, Prince of Kings, Prince of Life, Prince of Peace, Prophet. He's Redeemer, Resurrection and Life. He's the Rock, Root of David, Rose of Sharon, Savior, Seed of Woman, Shepherd and Bishop of Our Souls. He's Shiloh, Son of the Blessed, Son of David, Son of God, Son of the Highest, Son of Man. He's righteousness. He's true light. He's the true vine. He's truth. He's the witness. He's the word. He's the word of God. And aside from these names of God the Son, there's names that are employed for the Trinity as a whole. The Almighty, the Eternal God, the Father of Lights, the Fortress, Heavenly Father, Holy One of Israel, Jehovah, Judge, Living God, Lord of Hosts, Lord of Lords, Lord of Sabaoth, Most High, our Father, and our Strength. We have God's name in Scripture. And in the context of whatever the situation is, he has a different name. Because whatever name you call him, it's insufficient to describe him in every situation that he is in our lives. I want to talk just about a few of them that sometimes need clarification. At least I found it necessary to understand things. In Isaiah 53, Jesus is 
described in prophetically before he arrived in the incarnation this way. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The arm of the Lord is really referring to God's plan of salvation. Back in the time of the Exodus, God said, I brought Israel out by a mighty arm. The arm is a metaphor for God's ability to save mightily. And God wanted to bring salvation to all of mankind. And so he chose in his plan and in his wisdom to incarnate the Son in human form. 100% God, and yet 100% human. A baby born of a virgin came to earth to bring forth God's salvation for all men. Now, this was an idea that was unfathomable for the religious minds of the day. It still is to many people today that God actually became a human being, not just a strong and mighty human being, not a revered human being, but a human being so common that people would look at him and they would not desire him. There was no beauty in him. He was, in fact, despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. So when God starts off the chapter of Isaiah 53, he says, who's believed our report? Well, hardly anyone. Jesus' own brothers and sisters Yes, he had brothers and sisters. They did not believe on him. There was nothing supernatural in his appearance, but there was in him the fullness of the Godhead bodily. When he came to earth, he laid aside his powers and his majesty. In the second chapter of Philippians, it says, he emptied himself and took on the form of a slave. Emptied himself. Emptied himself of what? He was God. He always was God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. He came to earth as God. But what did he empty himself of? He emptied himself of those divine attributes that allowed him to do everything that God could do. He laid aside his omniscience, his omnipotence, so that he could experience life as a human being. He knew what it was to thirst. Remember on the cross on Good Friday, cried out, I thirst. He knew what it was to know hunger. When he was out in the wilderness for 40 days, it says afterward, he was hungry. Imagine the God who knew nothing of pain nothing of hunger, nothing of temptation, actually laid aside all that had protected him and came to earth as a person in the tabernacle of flesh. All the appetites that you have. Hebrews 4 says, he was tempted in every way like you and I are tempted, yet without sin. That has qualified him to be a great high priest for us, one of his names. A priest needs to identify and empathize with the people that he intercedes for. Jesus, if he had remained in heaven, could never fully understand temptation, difficulty, hunger, strife, rejection, betrayal. All the things that he suffered in this time on earth made him a faithful high priest for us. He knows exactly what you're going through. He knows what it's like when you're tempted, when you're weary, when you're lonely, when you're disappointed. He knows everything about it. And of course, in his crucifixion, he suffered more than we could ever imagine. In doing this, He's become a faithful high priest. Even though he's Lord of Lords, King of Kings, Lord of the Sabaoth, he is in all of those things a faithful high priest. The arm of the Lord. 
is a phrase that means God's strength, his ability to save. It means he has got the ability to turn human history to his perfect will by a mighty arm and a strong hand, it says in numerous places in Exodus and Deuteronomy. There's at least 12 times in the book of Isaiah where the arm of the Lord is mentioned, starting in the 30th chapter. Incidentally, Isaiah is a remarkable book in a couple of ways. The first 39 chapters are about judgment. And following that, there are 27 chapters of blessing and promise. And if you think about it, our Bible is divided into Old Testament 39 books and the New Testament of 27 books. The Old Covenant has been passed away and filled with the New Covenant of his promises. In a sense, Isaiah is the great evangelist of the Bible. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of God, whereby the day spring, another name for God, from on high visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. This is from the first chapter of Luke. The Annunciation of Christ's Appearance. He's called Dayspring. Dayspring is that moment when the sun breaks over the horizon for that first point and turns darkness into light, sheds the light in the new beginning. And Dayspring has always been acknowledged that way. When they translated the Bible into the newer Greek language, more commonly known, they took that word Daystar, that we have, as, and, and they used it about Jesus throughout the Septuagint, throughout the Greek translation of the, New Test, of the Old Testament. The day spring, the beginning of light. When you think about it, James described God as the God in whom no shadow of turning can be found. Now, if we had perfect lighting in this building, and I would turn my head, there would be a shadow wherever I turned my face to. So if I turned it very far this way, this part of my face would be in shadow. Or if I turned this way, this part of my face would be in shadow. But James points out something remarkable about God's light, and that is there is no shadow of turning in him. In other words, his face is perfectly toward you all the time. Doesn't even begin to turn away. There's so many images in God's name and the various names of God about being light. God is light and in him is no darkness, John writes in 1 John. He's called the day spring because the day spring brings light where there has been night. Jesus uses that word, day spring, to talk about our nights, the times when we go through darkness or the shadow of death, that he finally brings light when we start to despair or lose our way. The day spring from on high has visited us to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, it says in Luke. He's also called the branch, generally seen as a reference to the Messiah. It is really referring to the tribe that got the promise to always have an heir to sit on the throne. It was given to King David, and he said, you will establish a throne in Israel, and one of your descendants will always sit on it. Now, the word branch in Hebrew also means the word tribe or a descendant of a tribe. So when God calls Jesus the branch, he is saying he is the fulfillment of my promise to have a sovereign sit on the throne in Israel. One of his names in Zechariah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, is Jesus is referred to as the branch. 
I like that especially because in the New Testament, when he was talking to his disciples, he said, I am the vine, the true vine. And then he called us branches of his. Now, when you think about it, and I have had a little bit of experience with trees and branches, you cannot cut off a branch and have that live. All of its nutrients come up through the trunk of the tree, starting with the roots, and, and it feeds it. And Jesus took that understanding about how vital it was for the branch to abide in the tree that he said, unless you abide in me and I in you, you cannot bring forth fruit. You cannot bring forth life. One of the great deceptions of the flesh and being in the flesh is we begin to think that we're capable of doing anything that we want. We think that we live in a world where technology and advancement and science and literature, we certainly have cured many diseases. We've had breakthroughs. We've enlarged communication. We've set free from the atmosphere and the gravitational pull of our planet and even attained to landing people on the moon. And we begin in our arrogance to think that maybe we don't need to abide in God. Maybe we can go to God on a weekend, maybe a Sunday morning, and we can connect with him there. And he said, no, whatever fruit you can get on your own is nothing compared to abiding in me. What Jesus demonstrated after he emptied himself of his divine attributes, he became totally dependent on the Father and the Spirit for everything that happened in his ministry. You remember he and his disciples were invited to a wedding. And the mother, to whom Jesus owed honor, said, what are you going to do about the situation where the wedding has run out of wine? And Jesus said, well, you know it's not my time. Perhaps he had a different miracle in mind to introduce his power. But because of the commandment to honor his mother, he said, all right, I'll do it. Go get me some water that I can turn into wine. And she told the servants, you just do whatever my son tells you to do. And they brought gallons and gallons and gallons of water. As an unbeliever, I remember reading that. From my very cynical point of view toward the Bible, I thought the Bible was just so silly that people could never believe in it. Their miracles were preposterous and it couldn't happen. And I remember hearing that he was going to turn these water jugs, their contents, into wine. And I thought, well, maybe this is power of suggestion. Somebody's going to dip in a ladle and drink it. They didn't have glass glasses. They just had a cup. Maybe they thought it looked dark in there. Maybe it was wine. And the power of suggestion led them in the way. And I was so proud I had exposed, I thought, one of these fraudulent miracles. But you know what the end of the story is. One of the guests stood up and said, you know, I'm used to going to weddings where they give you the good wine, the beginning, and then after you're a little bit under the influence, you don't care what kind of wine they give you. And so they give you the cheaper wine later. And I remember reading that, and I said, what a failure of my theory. This isn't the power of suggestion. If it were the power of suggestion, then they would have tasted what they thought was inferior wine. But what did they taste? They tasted something superior. Now, how did Jesus do that? Did he do it because he was the omniscient, omnipotent God? No. He did it on dependence of the Holy Spirit and God the Father. The scripture identifies the turning of the water to wine as Jesus' premier, first of any kind, miracle. There were those stories that we hear sometimes that Jesus did miracles as a child, not supported by the scripture. The scripture says the very first miracle was the turning of water to wine. 
From then on, every miracle he did, every child he raised from the dead, every leper he cleansed, every blind eye he opened was all a matter of depending on God. Now he says to us, now that he is the risen, victorious Savior, healer, almighty God, King of kings, Lord of lords, he says to us, abide in me and then ask what you will and it shall be done for you. What I think we all try to do in our Christian life is start off as independent people, making our own choices, plotting our own course, and then say, God bless me. I need your help. I got a better way to approach it. I wished I had discovered this earlier in my Christian life. Let's turn it around and begin by saying, God, what do you want to do? And then as I follow his will, say, Lord, bless this. Not my will, but yours be done. I believe that we'd see many, many more miracles. You know when I see miracles in my life? When I'm doing his will and I get myself into an impossible situation. And I say to God, God, I am only here because you let me here. I'm not here by my own choice. So I know that I know that I know. I am not expecting you to bless my choices. I'm here resting in your promises. What a difference that makes. What a difference that makes. I've shared some of my stories. All pastors, all Christians that have walked with the Lord have other stories. When you know that you're in the center of God's will, you can be confident that his promises are active for you. Why? Because you're actually just a part of him revealing his agenda to the whole world, revealing his kingdom. That's it. It's not my glory, it's his. It's not my ambitions, it's his. It's not my agenda, it's his. And I'm just there. And I can't tell you how many times I've been in an impossible place. We were building our sanctuary over in Kauai. And a worship leader came who's leading worship. Actually, more of a concert, I would say. But he announced it. He says, I'm going to worship. You're welcome to join me. But I'm not here to entertain you, I'm going to take off into the throne room of God. If you want to follow me, you're welcome to. So he started playing at the piano and worshiping the Lord. And I looked around and I noticed people were taking their shoes off. No one had said, take your shoes off. No one had said, do anything. But as he ascended the mountain of the Lord in praise and worship, the Spirit of God came in great power and holiness. And people just spontaneously remove their shoes. And I'm watching this, and I could definitely feel the presence of God. And I start to get a vision. Now, we were in the process of building a new sanctuary, and I had done it the most economical way that I could imagine. I just took our small building and added a large building on attached to it. And I got a vision that I was walking outside of the church and I didn't see a building that just went in L shape. I saw an enormous building behind the sanctuary that stuck out on both sides. And as I am worshiping, it became so real to me that I believed that somehow during the worship service, the building was built. So I excused myself, put my shoes back on, went outside, and I went out along the side where there was not supposed to be a building, and I looked around, and it wasn't there. But what was there was so real to me. Now, we had already submitted our plans to the county and already hired a contractor, and we were well on our way, and they started to do it. And I saw this, and I said, there's something wrong with this. It's not what the Lord wanted. So I talked to the contractor. I said, hey, listen, would it be possible 
to extend this way to the setback on our neighbor's property another 60 feet, 80 feet, whatever it was. And he said, I don't know why not. And I thought, don't make me go down to the county and get another building permit. I'm just talking about doing it. He said, okay, we'll do it. In 10 months, we had built a sanctuary, not as beautiful as yours, but it was good, sat about 220 people. We built it in Kauai, paid for it, and furnished it all within 10 months. And I remember walking outside the building one day, and I looked down, and I saw that extension that I'd seen in a vision. It was effortless. It was effortless. Why? Because my job was only to abide in the vine and all the supply, all the coordination, all the finance, all the talent that went into it was provided by the Lord. It was his building. I go back to Kauai every now and then and I sometimes visit that building. I was there right after Hurricane Iniki where they had, oh, I don't know, some people say 200 mile an hour winds. There was another pastor there at that time and I said, how'd the building hold up? We didn't do anything special about it, but actually it held up perfectly. And to give you some idea of the force of the wind, a blunt two by four had been picked up by the wind and was swirling around and rammed into the building, the church building, and punctured the plywood T-111 siding with its blunt end. You know how blunt a two by four is. If I had a hammer, I couldn't puncture the T-111. And here the force of the wind had propelled this thing with such magnificent force, it punctured the T-111. And the pastor was so proud to show me, look at this thing, and pulled it out, stuck it back in. And yet, not a window was broken. The stained glass that we had over was untouched. The roof didn't come off. The building still stands. Why? Because I'm such a great engineer? Absolutely not. I don't know anything about building. I don't know the difference between a right-hand nail and a left-hand nail. But God had put this together. Why? It's not us doing what we do for God and then asking him to bless it. It's getting in sync with him. That's why abiding in him is so vitally important. Don't worry that you'll abide in God and he won't have you do anything. I think some people worry that God is going to ask him to do something. But as you abide in him and he imparts things to you, you begin to see it and to believe it. And then it's his agenda, not yours. You could say what every one of the saints has said in the Bible. Lord, this is what you want to do. How are you going to do it? How are you going to take care of it? How are you going to use a person like me? How are you going to bring the resources, the money, the talent to make this come to pass? Oh, come to think of it, Lord, I remember a promise you made. Faithful is he that called that also shall do it. There's so many magnificent names of God. One last one, and I'm just going to close with this, is the horn of salvation. Psalm 92, 9 and 10 gives us a picture of what that horn stood for. It says this, For lo, thy enemies, O Lord, for lo, thy enemies shall perish. All evildoers shall be scattered, but thou hast exalted my horn like that of a wild ox. Now, I wanted to think of a horn as being the blast on a victory trumpet. But that's not really the image that the Bible's talking about. It's talking about one of those massive horns on a wild ox. It's meant to be protection for the ox, but also it's a ferocious weapon in battle. The horn is a sign of strength and a means to victory. Micah 4.13 says, God to Jerusalem, Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make your horn iron and your hoofs bronze, and you shall beat in pieces many people. That empowering that comes from God is linked to one of his names. He's 
the horn of salvation. And the image, if it's carried to us, it means that he will strengthen us with hooves of bro- with bronze and horns of iron. He will empower us to be victorious. I wonder what David was thinking when he faced Goliath or Hezekiah and Jehoshaphat. I know at the beginning they thought themselves inadequate. But there's something that imbues them in power and an awareness when they're connected to God's will. You remember how David approached it. He didn't say, how dare you insult me, Goliath, little shepherd boy. He said, how dare you insult God? I come to you in the name of God. That name encompasses all that he is. His purpose, his kingdom, what he wants to do, his salvation, his plan. It's all a part of God. And David said, okay, here's God's plan. What are you going to What do you think you could do against God's plan? David said, if no one else in the armies of Israel will do it, I could do it because it's not me. It's God doing it. He'd do it through anyone. Now, that's a hard thing for us to believe. We think that God is just looking for some talented person to come along and do what needs to be done. We're all inclined to get to the back of the line and let someone else do it. But really, when you have the mind of God and you're abiding in him and you're trusting in all that he's done, the rest is just a matter of what the scripture said. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord. That's as far as I can go on the names of God. I touched on, well, I read the whole list. But I touched on ones that are obscure to many of our understanding, the branch, the horn. But I want you to know, just as Pastor Lockridge said, he is indescribable. If you can't think of a promise, go back over the list of God's names. Lord of Lords, King of Kings, Almighty. Just think about that and know that he's on our side. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you. These are willing to abide in you, to bring forth fruit in season. Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus that there be a new fruitfulness in every life here, Lord. It's never beyond your ability to impart vision and purpose, to give a goal what some people might even call a ministry. We ask in the name of Jesus that the last mile of the race that we run be the most fruitful time of our life. I believe you to do it. Moses began his ministry at 80 years old. I'd like to think that my life has been a preparation for when things really get started. Not that I'm winding down but I've been learning to abide in you. Each one of us has been learning to abide in you, learning what it means to say, not my will, but thine be done. Lord, empower us in Jesus' name. And if someone in our video realm is listening, I want to challenge you to turn your life over to a new Lord. Not you being Lord of your life, but... Allow Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Who would lay down their life for a friend? And the Bible goes on and said, who would lay their life down for an enemy? None but Jesus. We were estranged from God by our sinfulness, and Jesus came and died for us. If you have been in the driver's seat of your own life and you've gone places you'd never intended to go, Experience more hurt and loss than you ever expected. Time to turn over the the wheel of your life to Jesus. Make a difference. The Lord bless you. This has been Pastor Rob Finberg. It's been a great honor to speak here tonight with Pastor Barbara Tengon and this great group. The Lord bless you tonight as we conclude our service. Good night and aloha.